Whitney Walton is our third presenter today. Uh, Whitney is professor of history at Purdue University. She received her PhD from the University of Wisconsin and again has published many, many articles and book chapters, and, um, but again I'll focus in on her books. Um, most recently she published Internation uh, Internationalism, National Identities and Study Abroad, France and the United States, 1890 to 1970. Uh, that was published by Stanford in 2010. She's the author also of Eve's Proud Descendants, Four Women Writers in Republican Politics in 19th Century France, published in 2000. And then um, her first book, France at the Crystal Palace, Bourgeois Taste, an Artisan Manufacturer in the 19th Century, which was published by the University of California Press in 1992. Whitney's paper today is entitled Women's Memoirs of Napoleon and War. Books. Thank you. Um, after I, I wrote this paper, um, I added an, um, an additional part of the title because it came out to be about patriotism, heroism, and constructions of the self. In her autobiography, written between 1847 and 1859, novelist Georges Saint remembered a childhood dream from the time of Napoleon's Russian campaign when she was about 10 years old. She claims that there had been no news of the emperor or of the army for 15 days. In the absence of news, baffled at the disappearance of an entire army and of, quote, the man who filled the world with his name and Europe with his presence, unquote, and stimulated by the tales and comments that came within my hearing, Sand describes a fantastical vision of herself rescuing the French army and its leader. And now I quote from her autobiography. In my dream, I would imagine I had wings. I was discovering the endless snow, the vast steppes of white Russia. I was gliding, getting my bearings in the air, and finally locating the wandering columns of our unfortunate legions. I guided them in the direction of France. I showed them the way. When I regained awareness, I felt great joy at having saved the French army and its emperor. She continued this dream during the Hundred Days when she called Napoleon to task and she um, threatened him by saying, uh, I want you to tell me whether you are an ambitious, bloodthirsty monster or what I believe him to be, a kind, great, just emperor, a father to his people. In her dream, Napoleon confessed his errors and he promised to ensure the happiness of the French people. Whereupon, Sand, and I quote, touched him with the flaming sword that would make him invulnerable. So, Sand, who was born in 1804, had a lot to say about Napoleon and about war. Like many of her liberal contemporaries, she admired his success at upholding revolutionary principles like equality, and she regretted his vanity and self-interest that contributed to eventual military defeat and his own downfall. What is striking about these passages is how Napoleon and the war became vehicles for Sand's imagining imagined heroic contribution to France. Recent scholarship on the Napoleonic era, and particularly gender analyses related to Napoleonic wars, have focused on masculinity uh, within the army and on women outside of France, among other things. Alan Forrest's analysis of letters written by soldiers in the revolutionary and Napoleonic armies reveals how men experienced and represented war, their aspirations for victory, advancement, and peace, and both their devotion or resignation to fighting for the French Republic or Empire. Michael Hughes presents a fascinating portrait of masculinity forged in Napoleon's armies. And some more uh, related scholarship, Karen Hageman discerns how Napoleon's wars of conquest mobilized German women into action on behalf of their homeland. And other scholars suggest a similar inspiration to nationalism or patriotism among English women's response, uh, English women in opposition to Napoleon. However, surprisingly little has been written about French women's responses to and representations of Napoleon and the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. A notable exception is Denise Davidson's essay, 
on three French women who expressed their opposition to Napoleon in their personal writings, and Sudhir Hazeri Singh's analysis of Madame de Stael's liberal critique of Nap Napoleonic despotism. So this paper is a first foray, foray and it is a first, into, uh, for me. Several issues related to French women, gender, Napoleon, and war. It examines several texts by French women who either knew Napoleon or grew up during the First Empire to assess their interpretations of Napoleon, the wars characteristic of his regime, and the place of both in their understanding of French history and of themselves. It is mindful of several issues related to the analysis of different types of personal narratives, in this case, published autobiographies. The authors of these texts, Claire de Remusa, Queen Hortense, Marie Dagou, Hortense Allard, and Georges Saint, constructed their life stories from lived experience, memory, and the linguistic conventions through which they made meaning out of them. The timing of the writings is also important as different regimes and the passage of time rendered accounts of the Napoleonic era less or more popular and affected the memories of the authors. The memoirs by Remusa and Queen Hortense started in 1818 and 1816-17 respectively seem particularly fraught as they sought to reconcile their service or familial attachment to Napoleon with criticism of his regime shortly after he fell from power. The many books on the Napoleonic legend that developed over the 19th century for the most part ignore women's participation in it, and I hope to suggest some ways that women appropriated Napoleon into their self-constructions as French women. And finally, I wish to relate these women's writings on Napoleon and war to David Bell's arguments about total war during the revolutionary and Napoleonic eras if, as he asserts, the post-Napoleonic military culture made war a test of selfhood, what did this mean for women? Queen Hortense, Napoleon's stepdaughter and, as the wife of Napoleon's brother Louis, Queen of Holland, and Claire de Remusat, Lady of the Palace to Josephine Bonaparte, suggest the motivations and challenges they confronted in writing their accounts of life with Napoleon. Queen Hortense star stated that she wrote her memoirs in response to, quote, libelous accusations, quote, against the emperor and to tell the, quote, truth about herself. In 1816-17, she resided in Constance in Baden and was uncertain whether she would be allowed to remain there. Exiled from France and shunned by former friends, she was painfully aware of Napoleon's and her own poor reputation at that time. Similarly, Claire de Remusat indicates that the publication of Madame de Stael's Consideration sur la Révolution Française in 1818 precipitated the writing of her own account. She had kept a diary in the form of a personal correspondence during the time she served Josephine, but she burnt it in 1815, fearing that it might compromise her family at the time of Napoleon's return from Elba. By 1818, she was engaged in other writing projects when Stahl's work compelled her to write about Napoleon. And now I quote her. I was consumed with the need to speak of Bonaparte. I found myself telling of the death of the Duke of Anghein, the terrible week that I spent at Malmaison. And then she continued in a letter to her son, um, the author Charles de Remusat, that her emotions brought back more than memories. And she writes, as I am an emotional person, at the end of a few lines, it seemed that I was back in those times. The facts and the words came back to me as if on their own. So, encouraged by her son, Remusat nevertheless explained that recovering this part of her past was painful. She compared the task to that of a person who had spent 10 years in the galleys and tried to recall how he spent his time. And she wrote, today my imagination withers when returning to all these memories. I feel afflicted by my past illusions and my present feelings. You are right to say that I have a truthful soul, but then I do not feel without impunity as so many others do. And I assure you that for the past eight days, I am very melancholy when I leave the desk where you and Madame de Stael have put me. So, I do not think it is an exaggeration to suggest that both Queen Hortense and Remusat felt a similar compulsion to bear witness to traumatic times, as well as to justify their survival and to understand the source of that trauma, Napoleon Bonaparte. 
So moving back to Hortense, presenting herself as an unwilling public figure, pushed into the spotlight by her mother's advantageous marriage, and sacrificing her own desires for love in order to save that childless union, Hortense wrote at length about the strained relations among the extended Bonaparte family as Napoleon sought, usually successfully, to control everyone for the benefit of his dynastic ambitions and political strategies. She was often more forgiving of his public actions than of his domestic tyranny, asserting frequently that Napoleon responded to favorable public opinion and always put French national interest above self-promotion. Um, for example, she claimed that as a child, she told her teacher, Madame Campin, that she admired Napoleon's military conquests under the directory, but she could never forgive him for conquering her mother. She also wrote that while she could not judge whether his establishment of the empire was right or wrong, um, she, I quote her, all political parties supported it, and that when he returned from Elba in 1815, quote, everywhere the enthusiasm was intense. In the narrative, Hortense both proclaimed her loyalty to the man she regarded as her father, and she suggested that she merely went along with the majority that supported Napoleon. Throughout the autobiography, Hortense took pains to assert her patriotism, suggesting a higher devotion to France than to any particular political allegiance, and how a woman in her often awkward position could serve her country. So she talks a lot about, about patriotism, and, um, and she says that she was taught a feeling which very few women are conscious of, namely a love for one's country. Uh, and um, she said of herself that one should love one's country and must be constantly ready to sacrifice oneself for it, which she felt she had done by um, um, so, you know, going, along, um, going along with Josephine's marriage to Napoleon. Uh, later, when her husband Louis uh, became king of Holland, um, she was devastated at the prospect of assuming another nationality, she said, becoming something other than French. And she recorded that Napoleon could not understand her lack of ambition to be the Queen of Holland. And she says that she replied, I shall always have middle class ideals if that is the term to apply to love for one's country, one's friends, and one's family. For Queen Hortense, constant iterations of her patriotism and love for France both justified her role in and support for Napoleon's regimes and helped smooth over the conflicts when Napoleon fell from power, returned from Elba, and then went into permanent exile on St. Helena. It might also have reconciled her to several traumatic family experiences, including her unhappy marriage to Louis Bonaparte, the death of one of her sons in 1807, and Napoleon's divorce of Josephine in 1809. Um, uh, I think actually, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip a little bit about her responses to war. Um, Hortense had a pretty common response, which was, you know, she celebrated war when it was successful, and she deplored the loss of life uh, when things were going badly. Uh, but war became still more personal for Hortense when it reached French soil. She fulfilled and also aspired to heroic actions during the Allied invasion when she noted that her salon in Paris became a workroom for women making lint for the hospitals to treat the wounded French soldiers arriving in Paris in March of 1814. She claims that she tried to persuade Empress Marie-Louise to remain in Paris and to inspire the defense of the city. But the Empress left, and soon thereafter Hortense left also, for, she writes, what could helpless and an inexperienced women hope to accomplish? Hortense remained in France during the first restoration, but after the Hundred Days and Waterloo, she left the country, initially bitter because she considered uh, France to be ungrateful and unjust, but then claiming that she understood France's suffering from defeat and occupation, and she preferred to identify herself with France's victimization. So she ended her memoirs saying, I became proud of having my share in the persecutions which were inflicted on a great nation, but which could not subdue it. Women negotiated for positions under the consulate and empire, and they also justified themselves in their memoirs written after 1815. Claire de Remusat's mother secured positions for her daughter and son-in-law in the household of the consul, for which they were grateful since the revolution had wiped out the family fortune. 
Her story is one of youthful naivete when she began serving in Napoleon's household and a process of disillusionment upon closer acquaintance with Napoleon's shortcomings and her own maturity. Noting that, quote, everyone was outraged and disgusted with the horrors of revolution, unquote. She, she writes, they regarded the establishment of the consulate as the beginning of a new era for the country. She wrote of herself in 1802, I cannot help myself from thinking of the illusions I experienced then with a real clutch of, at my heart. I regret them the way one regrets the smiling thoughts of the springtime of one's life. According to Remusa, her opinions followed the same path as Napoleon did. Acknowledging that her family benefited from Napoleon's favor, she also claimed to have felt oppressed in serving a regime and a man whose values and practices were distasteful to her. And at one point, Talleyrand drove her to tears when he explained Napoleon's mistakes and knavery, particularly regarding the war in Spain, because, according to Remusa, she wanted to believe in the man she served, unlike men who did not need to love their master which I think is an interesting suggestion. Remusov felt affection for and loyalty to Josephine and asserted her family's partisanship to be with the Beauharnais rather than the Bonaparte. Uh, she recounted at length Josephine's distress over the possibility that Napoleon would divorce her for failing to bear him an heir. According to Remusat, Napoleon hesitated to divorce his wife because he valued the public's affection for her, especially as public opinion regarding himself was declining. The war in Spain diverted attention from the issue of divorce for a time, and then in a long footnote of her memoirs, um, the footnote explains that Claire de Remusat decided before the fact that uh, she would leave with Josephine in the event of the divorce, and she did. So moving on to a younger generation that did not personally confront the choices and allegiances of elite women during Napoleon's rule. Um, but it is clear the influence of Napoleon and war in their lives was substantial. Sand's autobiography begins with her ancestors and the prominent role of the military in her family background. The first part of her autobiography is entitled Family History from Fontenoy to Marengo. And much of the first 400 pages of her autobiography consists of letters that her father wrote to her grandmother, most of them while he was a soldier in the Republican and Imperial armies from 1798 to 1807. Sand identified closely with her father, who died from the f a fall off a horse when Sand was four years old. Her father, Maurice Dupin, was eager to serve the Republic and launch a military career, which he did, enlisting when he was 20 years old, in spite of his mother's opposition. And um, she quoted from a letter of Maurice uh, to his own mother, do calm yourself. Uh, he wrote to his mother, the proclamation, the Jourdain Law of 1798, decided me, and I am a soldier of the Republic. Sand claimed that her father was a Republican, as she was herself, and that for young men at that time, war is the only means of advancement. Uh, Maurice Dupin's letters charted his progress and setbacks in rising through the ranks, and Sand interpreted them as a record of his democratic and meritocratic beliefs. According to um, uh, asserting to his mother that he was proving himself by merit rather than by virtue of being Marshal de Saxe's grandson, he wrote, even you, my dear mother, you can no longer be considered an untrustworthy lady from the old regime, but the mother of an avenger of our country's wrongs. Yes, mother, you have to see it in that light in France these days. I haven't exactly become the Jacobin of the regiment, but I have found out that you have to stick to the straight and narrow and serve your country without a backward glance. You have to feel lucky that we must now earn by ourselves whatever we used to have by virtue of our birth. Corresponding to Sand's democratic and republican politics as an adult, she presented the French army under the directory as the only remaining institution that upheld revolutionary ideals. Um, uh, and she writes, as for the Frenchmen in the army, they were necessarily the friends of all who had remained in France. They were the defenders of everyone, people, bourgeoisie, and patriotic nobility, heroic martyrs of freedom. Their glorious mission was to defend the nation. Sand continued, public spirit only lived in the military. So there's this exchange between her and her interpretation of her father's letters. 
Um, however, I am going to move on in the interest of time to talk a little bit about a different way that Napoleon and the war fit into a woman's self uh, construction. For Sand's contemporary Marie Dagou, who also came from an aristocratic military family and whose parents met and married as a result of war, the Vendean Wars against the Republic were more heroic than the armies of the Republic and Napoleon. Her father, Alexandre de Flavigny, was in Frankfurt in 19, 1797 with royalist troops when he met the widowed Marie Elizabeth Bosman. Uh, against the wishes of the Bosman Protestant banking family, the young widow married Flavigny, and the couple eventually moved to France in 1809. Uh, Dagou enjoyed um, an idyllic childhood in France until uh, Napoleon's return from Elba. And she writes of this time, thus Napoleon Bonaparte, returning suddenly to recover his crown, disseminating troubles and fear to everyone, at the same time sowed the first disturbance in my peaceful childhood. And she really had to grow up uh, in, in, in her account uh, because Napoleon ended her childhood. So she and Sand incorporated Napoleon and uh, the war very differently into their accounts. And I finally just want to, to mention in passing um, one of their contemporaries, Hortense Allard, who was in fact a Bonapartist from a young age. And um, she uh, represented uh, the death of the wife of one of Napoleon's ministers as representing a, a woman's version of heroism in the Napoleonic era. And the grief of her friend, Laure, uh, she writes, uh, resembled that of a Roman matron. And she says of her friend, she had criticized the emperor's despotism and she had displeased him by her courageous opposition. She wept for the great talents, the illustrious misfortunes, a slow and deplorable end that she would have liked to soften. She wept for the invaded homeland, so many van vanished conquests, the destroyed armies, the unmatched soldiers whose bloody bodies gloriously were strewn across the roads of Europe. And if there had been under the empire feelings worthy of such an elevated, lamentable, and tragic history, they were here in Vallon, her friend Laura's home, where the emperor's battles had been so celebrated, where he was rendered uh, such touching homage in his death. For Alar, Laura embodied the emperor's greatness and heroism in her own great and heroic grief. And she said of her friend, she became my emperor. So, rather than draw definitive conclusions from this rather scattershot examination of women's memoirs, I want to suggest some issues for further investigation. How can these and other personal narratives or ego documents by women be analyzed to enrich the understanding of Napoleon, of war, and their place in French history? I would like to pursue the idea of trauma behind women's accounts and the way that it motivated and shaped their narratives. I intend to follow up on the suggestion in Rémy Sa's and Queen Hortense's accounts about gender differences in service to the state and family. And related to this, develop a deeper understanding of patriotism, especially as women imagined and performed it. While I am still not convinced that post-Napoleonic military culture made war part of selfhood, nonetheless, the evidence presented here does suggest some ways that war infused women's life stories and therefore their self-constructions. Dagu was forced to grow up because of the Hundred Days. Sand identified with her father's experience of war as a field for talent and fantasized her heroic rescue of French troops. Allard designated a woman's profound grief for Napoleon and for France as heroic. Perhaps Napoleon and war enabled forms of feminine patriotism and heroism, both in support of and in opposition to them. Thank you.